Um, I just want to say good morning to everyone. Thank, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thanks to Boston Startup for, for having us, uh, and especially thank you to all of our panelists for giving us their time today. Uh, our goal with this talk is really to gain a better understanding how to navigate FDA regulations, uh, how startups can really be as prepared as possible to set, you know, set their expectations when entering uh, a regulated environment. So just a quick background on me. Uh, I've been a chef my entire career. I've spent 22 years in restaurants and hotels around the world. Uh, I've dealt with the FDA in a very, very unique, very narrow, but um, very long uh, experience with them. Uh, my current business partner and I have uh, released six products to the Canadian market under Kashi and Kellogg labels. So we've gone through contract manufacturing, verifying certificates of origin, lots of things that are, that are food specific with the FDA. But uh, this, this talk today is really gonna be focused on biomedical uh, and other companies that are in that, in that realm. So I wanted to uh, allow the panelists to kind of give a quick intro for themselves and uh, really give, give some insight into their perspective on how to, to uh, communicate their message today. So uh, Nicole, if you don't mind starting us off, Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Palmer. I'm a partner with Lando and Anastasi. We're an IP uh, boutique law firm, um, Boston, um, previously in uh, Kendall Square. Um, my practice, uh, to a large extent, uh, pertains to medical device work. Uh, my own personal background is in chemical engineering, so I'm working a lot with uh, uh, clients of all sizes, um, uh, a lot of biomaterials work and, and medical device work. And you know, our clients are routinely facing um, this exact issue head on, trying to navigate the regulatory environment while also safeguarding their um, IP territory and kind of assessing what that landscape looks like. And um, to some extent, there's um, you know, some overlap and synergies with respect to the two processes in, in other aspects. Um, you know, it, it sort of raises some issues, um, which I'm happy to, um, or conflicts, which um, you know, are important to, to keep in mind and navigate. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to all of that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Tim? Uh, hi, let me see. Hi, everybody. This is Tim Samard. Uh, glad, to, glad to be here, part of this great team. Um, my background, I started as a software engineer. I think we all came from different perspectives here, which is a terrific panel. Uh, I started as a software engineer on the NASA Space Shuttle. Uh, that's where I kind of cut my teeth. Uh, then I went to Ernst & Young, a big kind of for accounting firm and did global strategy, technology and organizational transformation for about 20 years. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started a company focused on uh, a pharmacist, the role of the pharmacist delivering comprehensive, not just medication care, but uh, comprehensive patient care. And that was my first entree into the FDA kind of struggle that we all have uh, in dealing with the FDA around delivering medications and delivering devices too. Currently, I'm a National Science Foundation mentor, assisting um, an industri industry mentor for Professor um, Zupanek, a biology professor that's building a simulation algorithm using machine language and machine learning and AI for figuring out which kind of research pathway is optimized for stem cells to regenerate tissue. Wow. And I'm also the CEO and founder of a company called Alex Health, A-L-Y-X Health, and we're focused on this issue of increasing access to care and empowering nurse practitioners, nurses, and other clinicians by helping them develop, uh, start, operate, and grow independent virtual and in-community clinics because we just don't have enough providers to provide access. And so we also have a machine language or machine learning and AI continuous remote patient monitoring system so that we can actually give purpose-built tools to clinicians so they can actually deliver higher quality of care and we can do it at a lower cost impact and we can help patients be more self-managed. And that's kind of what I'm up to. Wonderful. Wow. All right. Jennifer? 
Great. So I'm an early stage investor. I cut my teeth at uh, boutique investment banks in the Pacific Northwest and then uh, ran investor relations for a publicly traded company designing software for uh, the manufacture of semiconductor chips and then uh, arrived here in Massachusetts through MIT and spent the last few years investing on behalf of the state of Massachusetts at Mass Ventures. And now I've left that and I'm raising a new fund. We're focused on AI trust and transparency, both the tools and data it takes to make AI work um, responsibly. And the, in terms of the FDA focus, I'm going to freely and completely admit that this is not my expertise. Um, but where I, where I may be able to provide some insight is I am one of the few people who would still look at medical device companies because of this software and AI diagnostic element. Sure. And um, because of that, I think I can help people think about uh, how do you de-risk your company from a perspective of an investor. And then if you're trying to communicate to me how you're de-risking an FDA process, what might help? Sure. Thank you. Thank you all for, for sharing. I think, Jennifer, I'd actually like to stay with you and, and kind of continue on that path of what you were just describing. And really, even, even though the, the specific FDA regulation is unique to each company and what they're trying to accomplish, what kind of advice can you give to startups to, to, to really start to prepare? I mean, what, what kind of pathways can they evaluate? Um, you know, I know that you're involved with Techstars and really, you know, have, have been on a lot of uh, kind of boards and, and, and seen various companies in different markets uh, move forward. But what can, can founders really do to prepare themselves to enter into an engagement with the FDA? Sure. So, um, you know, again, somebody who really knows the FDA process can talk to that specifically. But let me talk first about when, when you're an investor, you're constantly looking at how do I balance um, opportunity with my sense of risk. And what I want to know is that you're de-risking things as quickly as possible, that you really, really understand your market and you understand what needs to be accomplished to move the company forward on that path. And if one of those things is going to be a regulatory pathway, the more quickly you can start the learnings of what it will take and what's required and what you can do to chunk that up into pieces that you can de-risk quickly to, to move along those pathways, the sure. better it is for me. That's, that's, thank you. And, and Nicole, I'd like to bring you in on this is, is <clears throat> being able to de-risk something for example, in the IP kind of realm, you really have to know what's already been protected, what's already on the market, what, what, what can you put forward that really is going to give you the most chance, the best chance, I should say, of, of, uh, of a company really obtaining IP for a certain, certain item. Sure. Yeah, that, um, thinking of de-risk, um, IP is a big component of that. Um, right. You know, it's it's really important to sort of know your landscape and the field you know that you're entering into. We find that typically the innovators are in perhaps even the, the best position to know who the what what is the competitive landscape look like? Who are the big players? What are um, you know small and, and larger firms um, investigating? Um, you know, there's that question of the patentability of your own ideas versus freedom to operate and, and whether or not you can, um, you know, perhaps you, you actually need a, a license to a third party's technology in order to even do what you want to do. Right. Um, so ideally, you, you know, you have something new and inventive um, so that you can get, um, you know, it, it can be patentable. Um, at the same time, some, sometimes a medical device company is looking at to kind of move quickly through the regulatory process, some kind of equivalency, um, 510k type submission, in, in which case, um, you know, maybe you're also trying to show that you're, you're, you're substantially similar in some ways. So it's kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy. Nicole, can I, can I ask, when you say quickly, can you give us a reference on what kind of what the standard would be and what would be considered quickly through through that process? Um, 
Well, it, I think it really, really varies uh, quite a bit. Um, okay. I think the, the clients that, that I've worked with have, have uh, if, if they can um, kind of meet that, that standard threshold, um, you know, they could move through the process within a year. Um, you and, know, is, otherwise it, it's, it's and, and is the, is, is this market is kind of the biomedical market. Do things change so quickly that if someone enters something in and, and it's a year before uh, they can get approval or even have really uh awareness of where they stand is it possible that something else has has really changed and now they have to kind of rethink their whole their whole concept or are they able to kind of stay with the process while evaluating the market at the same time i don't i don't know how transparent you know the fda might be in in some of these some of these circumstances yeah no i I think it's all about building the relationship with um the officer that that you're assigned to uh, at the regulatory agency um you know, for the most part, I think that that can be a, a good relationship if um, kind of navigated and handled properly and, um, you know, kind of under, you know, have a good sense for, for where you stand in, in the process. Um, Got it. That's been for the most part, my, my client's experience. Um, and again, a lot of my client, again, um, you know, being focused on intellect, the intellectual property component, a lot of my clients have either own uh, IP uh, regulatory counsel or working with a, a consultant to help them move through that process. Got it. And consultancy, I mean, in my experience, what, what, if, what if a startup, I mean, my, my initial thought is that most startups are in their planning phases, need to budget for a consultant in this circumstance, of course. Uh, but what, what other options are there out there? I mean, and, and Tim, I'm not sure if you want to chime in here, but what, <clears throat> if I'm starting a business, if I'm not experienced in, this this realm necessarily how can i how can i what, what's what's my best path forward to tackle um navigating the fda or at least to get the ball started with an officer for example am i able as a business owner to just communicate to apply to to put forth documentation to engage on my own i mean clearly there's experts in every field but right yeah i, I i'll give i i'll give nicole um a, a uh, an idea here. The reality is, is that this, I, I tell me, I tell my clients and people that I help is find the best IP attorney you can possibly find. Mm-hmm. Um, so the stuff that Nicole does, you just can't replace a good IP attorney. And the sooner you do it, the better you're off. Um, we, my first company about 10 years ago, we actually, uh, acquired some IP and we actually ended up asserting it and winning a $6 million, um, patent infringement suit. So patents protect you, but they're also a defensive mechanism. FDA in that process is also works in that kind of similar fashion because you have to find out where your unique position in that marketplace is for prior art and um, whether you can actually create a defensible position around both the FDA and and the uh, and, and the patent office, and then from uh, on the uh, on the device side, I always look at it and make sure that is it a class one, two, or three, and can I move up and down that kind of level of due diligence? And most of my experiences is, is in trial um, is in. Uh, in the phase three trials, clinical trials, because okay. we built software around, and we're working on it right now, to do uh, virtual uh, virtual data coordination and analytics using uh, ML and AI to date, to collect passively collect data because of COVID nineteen issues. Okay. You can't go to doctors' offices anymore. You can't go to patient homes as much as you can. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, clinical trials have have really slowed down. Got it. Got it. I actually want to. We have a we have a question that seems to fit Tim kind of in right just what you were speaking about. Uh, the question states that I'm in health informatics building a digital platform, clinical and radiology. The platform falls into five ten k class two. How long is the application slash approval process? Yeah, that's really a Nicole question. She's got a better, she's got a more current understanding of how long that might take. I, I, yeah, I'll punt. <laughs> yeah, um, class two. Um, I I would think over, you know, probably maybe almost two years. Um, but okay. again, it just kind of really varies quite a bit. 
Sure. Um, you know, like Tim said, the, the level of scrutiny and the, the requirements uh, vary among the, the classes. So. Right, right. All right, well, thank you. Talk, Nicole, I'm curious about what, for somebody who's asking that question, what are their first steps along that de-risking and prep path to, sure. to you know, because you, you're going to be able to hopefully very quickly find a way to set up an experiment that proves that you'll be equivalent to an existing device, right? Yeah. Um, I was just, yeah, I was sort of thinking as an aside that um, in some respects, the the um, timelines fit nicely together in that we ideally would like to include data in our patent applications. Um, and sometimes we'll, if it's not, the data is not available yet, we'll set up a prophetic example sort of outlining what the, what the study is going to look like and what the desired endpoints are going to be. Um, that tends to be helpful um, in proving, um, you know, in the FDA, you're looking for, for efficacy in, in terms of treatment, um, not too far off from, um, you know, the, the, the written description requirements um, and enablement requirements of, um, of the patent laws. So that's another area where there's some interesting overlap. But um, yeah, you know, our advice to early stage companies is always to really sort of inventory um, the different buckets of IP, you know, sometimes these intangible assets, you don't even necessarily know what you have in terms sure. of patents, um, copyright, and increasingly you know, trade, trade secret is not to be overlooked um, as another kind of tool in the bucket. Yeah, and, and Nicole, on that, are you able to just go a little further into kind of understanding the, the details of the FDA approval cycle, kind of what, what you can see, you know, startups running into as they're going through this process? Um, let's see. Um, well, this is open to anyone, Tim, if you yeah, if Jennifer, anyone like else to join as well. Wants to jump in. Yeah. Well, I was just going to, I was just going to mention, uh, Nicole, uh, was pointing out something that I think really important that is docu again, early stage in the beginning, you don't have a lot of money. Attorneys are expensive, you know? Um, and the reality is, is the document everything and the better you document it so that you can communicate it to the IP attorneys and the other participants or the other stakeholders in that process, uh, the better you can document it, the, um, it's going to save you a, a whole bunch of trouble downstream and it'll make it much more efficient and it'll make it faster for Nicolta and other attorneys to figure out kind of what, what is the opportunity here. And you can do, you can do, you can do your, a lot of your own research too, so that they're not having to do research in the office. So there's ways of laying that kind of the idea, the potential conflicts, the potential prior art um, out there so that it's easy, easy to, to digest. Got it, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I wanted to ask if you could just touch more a little on, on kind of de-risking on, on maybe just kind of at a high level, a few bullet points of, of how people, how, how founders can make sure that they are de-risking by also maintaining, you know, uh, um, enough momentum, enough energy, enough resources to, to move things forward while not just, you know, cutting off certain, certain things. Right. So first, first, first thing is, Always when you have something that's like this, where there's a regulated advice, that's going to be a gate for you really getting to market and getting into production with the product. But I need to see as an investor that you really understand your market. You understand where this product will fit. Are there going to be people compelled to buy it? Who has the budget to pay for it? Right? So the more sort of research you can do up front to try to understand who your customer is going to be, what that what that business model will look like that helps um, and if as you do that you're in the place where you can start to line up your initial trials for the prototype product and get some of those people bought in that right. helps right um, i think the other thing it's come up a couple times how do you how do you hire the right consultant or find the right consultant even before then there's that set of having the best conversations you can have with the smartest people you can find who've tread this path before people like Tim or like Nicole, but maybe there's also other founders 
sure. who's done a class two device company before, for example, can talk to you about how they walk the path. Right. And then, right. and can serve as advisors as you set things up. Sure. Sure. No, that's great. That's great advice. I, I appreciate that. We have, we have another question coming in. Um, it says, not all investors are very experienced in FDA requirements. What are the most important things in a pitch to show you have the FDA side covered? I'll leave this open to anyone who feels, feels that they might have the best, uh, best response. Maybe we should start since he's been the person who's had to, had to satisfy investors before, and then I'll chime in. Yeah, I mean, if you get a PMA, you know, private market authorization to come ahead, I mean, if you've got that, uh, I mean, you've got, it's like having a strategic partnership. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm almost signed with, you know, pick a, pick a you know, um, Santa Fe or any of the other kind of MERS, um, uh, any of the other kind of uh, biotech company. I'm almost signed with a distributor manufacturer. Almost doesn't count. It's kind of like the FDA and a patent. Almost doesn't count. So the closer you can get to actual approval from an investor side, and I'm an investor too, is, is that I kind of want to see you get past that hump. But again, you know, from an investor side, the more the risk, the higher the upside. The less the risk, the lower the upside. So, you know, risk gets compensated. So. Right. I think well, one thing that I think is, I mean, I think it's really important that you try to move the sort of market sides in tandem with the regulatory side so they can come together. And um, once you have approval, to, because once you have approval to sell, let's say, for example, that you've gotten the approval that you're a good enough predicate device for um, concussion detection, then I'm looking at, okay, great what's the next level of approval that you can get, but also what kind of market progress can you make in that time from the, of the initial approval? Can you get out and sell this product as it is? And what does that look like? And what's your path to market? So it's, you can't, can't do one kind of in pure isolation of the other. Yeah. We, we should, we should also just kind of clarify, are we talking biotech and pharma or are we talking device? Because yeah, they, they have, device just yeah, they not, not just you, Jennifer, just, just for the audience. I mean, biotech is a whole nother, um, a sure. whole nother um, category. It's not even a good comparison. Devices are to me uh, easier. I don't know, Nicole. I mean, I have some friends in that pharma biotech space and, they get $25 million as a, you know, seed fund, you know, as a seed round. Um, so, and it's a long, as we all know, it's expensive and a long-term kind of process to, to, to find new drugs and, and, and biologics. So uh, devices are a little bit more, I don't know, I won't say the pedestrian, but in any sense, the imagination, but they are, they are easier than, than bio. Yeah. I think one of the challenges is that there are, that one of the things that's happened is that um, from the investor side, there are relatively few investors who really do device today because mm. they have because they have this characteristic of being harder to walk, sometimes niche nichier products, and not the enormous upside of the biologic, right? Got it. And then on the biologic side, you have investors who are very very specialized in understanding how you bring these products to market and what they need to see for risk. And usually they're looking for you, if I understand it right, and Tim, you can correct me, to get through at least the animal trial portion and be on your way into that clinical trial before they even take a taste. And then you right. need to make a certain amount of progress with them. If you succeed in that trial, they're gonna sell you for the next level of de-risking. Yeah. Yeah. It's like two or three years of just bench testing, you know, bench research and so on. And it's at Harvard and MIT, you know, it's, it's all, it's all, you know, these, these uh, educational institutions of research and uh, translational medicines and stuff like that uh, at Harvard, they're doing that early research that, you know, is federally funded or institutionally funded. And then it becomes, Oh, now we've got, you know, a potential to commercialize something. Yeah, so I don't think any private investors are playing in that space. 
I Gen think um, Go ahead, with, uh, no, just thinking about a lot of the types of uh, devices that, that might be relevant here, you know, it's important to sort of identify and very clearly articulate, okay, knowing what the state of the art is, what's the pain point, you know, maybe with some clinical, um, just kind of uh, anecdotal, um, you know, points from the, the medical community and from patients, but, you know, what are, what's causing um, lack of, um, you know, patient compliance or, um, you know, clinically, what are, what are the issues that the doctors are having? Or, you know, maybe you have an idea for some kind of a combination type therapy now. Um, and, you know, from there, it's easier to kind of figure out what your narrative is in terms of, um, you know, maybe you can have that equivalency in terms of, um, you know, fundamental functionality um, to satisfy some of the regulatory requirements, but with design changes, um, that could provide a significant competitive advantage. Um, you know, there's your business case um, and, and sort of take that angle. I think that's a really good observation. Um, I, I don't know uh, where kind of this fits in the title of this, uh, this panel, but um, as we move from fee for service in healthcare, where everybody gets compensated or reimbursed, mm -hmm. when we move from fee for service to value-based care, Pharma and biotech and any kind of device company are going to have to show efficacy. They're going to have to show the outcomes uh, for patient populations. So if you've got a device that says, I can improve customer adoption by 25% versus existing uh, products, then you're going to have, as a device company, you're going to have to prove that. And a lot of, you can see that in ACOs, accountable care organizations, where you have more risk. And then when you talk about drug companies, um, and I'm, I'm working with one now, that you talk about drug companies, and the, the adherence, so my last company was focused on the pharmacists and medication adherence and medication therapy management. So think about the idea that they did a study on cardiac patients. Now, people have had, like, serious serious surgeries and so on, their adherence to medication post-op was like 57%. And you would think that you'd want to take your medication as the doctor instructed you in sure. that particular cohort of patients. And you look at diabetic patients. I mean, you're lucky if you get 50%. Um, and so adherence to the medications that we produce is, is really not very good at all. And so in my last company, we were looking at this idea of diabetic patients, you know, and COPD and asthmatic patients. But when you, it, it, when we found that if we really wanted to move the dial on patient outcomes, and I was just looking at the disease state or the condition without looking at the medication, I wasn't ever, we were never going to move the dial on the outcomes because the adherence is so bad. So we ended up converging that and saying for the pharmacist, let's help the pharmacist actually have comprehensive tool sets so they can actually address the patient holistically and not just from a narrow view of the medications. So this gets again to looking at the idea, if we want to really improve healthcare or patient outcomes, then we have to do two things. One, we have to make it easier for the patient to be more self-managed. And we have, to, um, we have to think of how these tools, whether it's technology or remote monitoring or something like that, voice, Alexa is really terrific to actually collect data that gives us much more higher fidelity insight about the patient's activities so we can come back and monitor and, and suggest inter interventions for that patient. So we're actually looking at it from a population health management perspective, but we're looking at it at a personalized level, a personalized medicine type perspective because we've got exactly what that particular patient's doing at home through IOT devices or through uh, wearables. Sorry that answer was so 
Wow. No, I think that's, I mean, some of these, uh, there's, there's, there's lots of questions and I want to see if we can touch base on them all. So, so I, I have one here, Jennifer, I'm going to, I'm going to guess this is, is in your uh, ballpark. Uh, the question says, how should I handle the issue of estimating the MVP release timeline of my platform when beta testing requires FDA approval first? Investors want to know this. Ah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I have a super good answer for that. What I would, what I usually tell people when they have that kind of milestone is to work backwards. So to go and to think about, here's the point in time at which I should have this approval. And these are all the boxes that have to be checked off for the FDA to say yes. And after that, here's what has to happen to, for go to market. Is there any of that go-to-market stuff that I can de-risk earlier? That means that once the box is checked, I could go faster. Sure. Can you show me you've done some of that work in advance? And then for the what needs to be done, chunk it out and tell me when and how much time. Because that's your way. The, take the things that you can control and move those and de-risk those. Got it. Does that help? I think so. I mean, it, I, for me, you know, understanding this process from your side, from, from, from all the panelists is really, I mean, it's just extremely insightful. So um, I, I, I would try to use it. I'll try to use an example. From, I think that's a good. Um, without disclosing anything, that's the tricky part. So I'm going to take an example from a university where it's not, you know, the thing's not yet out of the lab, but there was a very creative design team looking at a new, um, inhaler device and they were doing all the right things around sort of the device itself they'd looked at the device itself they would figured out how long it would take to walk the path to approval they figured out what type of predicate devices there were what um, clinical work that needed to be done around the device they had built prototypes they had gotten people trying the prototypes they were starting to be able to demonstrate that the prototypes could deliver the aerosol in the way that you wanted them to be delivered um, but along the way they discovered something that threw a whole wrench in how they approached the problem they had thought that the medication package could also be changed so that the device form factor would be more effective but the problem was the medication they were targeting is today so low cost. This is really a shame. It points to big, like larger problems in our healthcare and, and drug system. Right. But the, the form factor for this particular medication, it was so entrenched and so cheap and cheap globally that there was zero motivation on behalf of the drug companies that package this drug and manufacture that portion to make any change which meant that the whole way they envisioned their product would have to reshape for the business model to work because otherwise the economics would never work and how could they have prevented that is, is there a way that they could have i think so well fortunately they they did near the beginning and the way is to to make sure that you're not just thinking about your cool device. Because a lot of engineers and technologists, we get in love with the thing that we think will solve the problem. And we haven't fully explored the problem from all the stakeholder point of views and where the levers are for the economics and the business to work. Got it. So make sure you're de-risking those things as you work on the science pieces. Sure. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go on to one more question. I, I feel like the, some of these questions are really just so specific that they help spark a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot more conversation between, between the panelists. So uh, someone has asked that they've heard it takes nine months to get approval. Class two was cited prior art slash predicated device. Uh, is this estimate too optimistic for digital platform? So nine months to get approval. Not sure, Nicole, no, is that something maybe, that you... Uh, it seems um, a bit optimistic, although maybe in um, you know, the digital, maybe there's, uh, maybe things are moving a little bit quicker there. Um, it's, it's certainly possible. Okay, all right. 
Thanks for that. It, to me, it sounds fast, but sure. um, it may be that it's doable. Uh, if you really have all your ducks in a row in your research to prove that you are um, the same and as effective as the existing predicate device. Um, if you're delivering something with AI and ML today mm -hmm. as part of the diagnostic or as part of that device, I would take a good look at the FDA's recent guidance on responsible AI and how they're thinking about those devices and make sure you're building a process for that as well. Great, great. Uh, Tim, I have a question for you. I'm wondering if you can give us uh, a few bullet points that you believe are kind of key to navigating this. I know that we've touched on so many aspects of this, but for someone who has gone to market, taken companies, you know, uh, through different levels of funding, et cetera, what are, what are a few bullet points at a high level that you can communicate to all of our viewers on, on how they can, I, I would call it sidestep some landmines and, uh, continue on that path. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I started that with suggesting that the first thing to do is is to document everything right. and to document it rigorously. Um, you understand what there's a roadmap, just like technology, there's a roadmap for a device going through an FDA process or a biotech going through an FDA process. There's a, and then the second thing I said, you got to hire Nicole or someone uh, that's really uh, top of the game in terms of IP. And, you know, something came up recently and it was interesting because um, that, that worth kind of a note that a lot of uh, companies, uh, a lot of people basically take the cookie cutter approach. They, they've got an FDA approval on a product and then they take it again and then they just replicate that process. And in a conversation just in the last couple of weeks that came up that, you know, I'm very big on uh, configurable system views an ecosystem view and that's configurable because you have internal strategic shifts and then you have external regulatory drivers and market drivers. So the more you can make your process reflective of that, uh, the better off you are. And one of the things. Hmm. Did we lose Tim there for a sec? Tim, I think we might have, uh, I think you froze up on us for a moment it? there. Let's give him just a second and see if he can. Yeah. He knows how to do virtual. Did I lose you? Just for, a, just for a few seconds. Yeah, you froze up just for a second. No one knows how to do virtual clinical trials. Freezing again. Tim, yeah, Tim, I think we're... No one... There you go. No one's... Okay, good. So yep. no, one's, no one knows how to do virtual clinical trials. Everyone's doing it the old way. And we've been talking to a lot of companies the last 10 years about doing virtual trials. Uh, data collection, back office in the cloud, analytics, real time, and uh, now everyone wants to do it. Right. So, um, so that's a that's a uh, a few things is just try to think ahead a little bit. Sure, sure. And uh, is there any is there any? Um, I, I may rephrase this question. Do you recommend? And I know Nicole, you had you had mentioned earlier that you prefer to go into the IP with having some kind of data, with having some kind of uh, proven information to submit. But do you recommend having kind of a pre-submission meeting with the FDA when you're just starting the product development, or is it is it more efficient to wait until you have some clinical data? Um, yeah, no. I, again, in the interest of just kind of the more dialogue, the better. Um, I don't see any harm in that. Um, you know, the system is set up to respect the um, kind of public disclosure considerations um, that might otherwise be damaging to the patent process. So in that regard, any kind of confidential information that's shared um, you know, as such confidential um, data rights, et cetera, um, because it's working with a, a federal agency, a member of the public, uh, an interested member in the public could submit a FOIA request and get access um, to the back and forth that you have with the regulatory agency. IP, confidential information, is um, you know, supposed to be excluded from, um, from 
FOIA request, but you have to, you know, to, to de-risk, you have to make sure that everything is it's all about labeling in that regard, so. Got it. But is it, is um, it true, Nicole, and that, I, I, I'm curious, I think I've heard, and I could be wrong about this, that within your region, there's usually somebody who's within the FDA who's responsible for the type of thing you might be doing and you're able to have conversations yeah. with them in advance of really getting going to understand what might be required. Is that right? That's my understanding too. So there, there are definitely resources um, on the fringe who are kind of your, your gateway to the, the bigger process and it would be appropriate to have those initial discussions um, with those parties. Um, you know, I, I mentioned including data in your patent applications. It's still very important to file as soon as possible. So I, I didn't mean to, um, you know, yeah. detract from that. We are now in a, basically a, a first to file system. Um, the US used to be uh, fairly unique in um, having it be a first, a first to invent system where certainly that, that documentation that Tim was talking about and, um, was, was very important to securing your priority claim. We've sort of harmonized more with the rest of the world and um, we're more of a, a first to file system now. Um, so getting at least a provisional application on file early before having any of those um, discussions um, would, would definitely be a good idea. And then, then you have your stake in the ground and can um, you know, take the, the priority window one year to, to sort of you know, proof of concept, figure out um, where, where things are going, maybe supplement it. We have a lot of clients that are sort of doing serial uh, provisional filings as things develop um, over in those early stages, um, just to kind of build out the, um, the protection um, early and often. Yeah, and Tim, Tim had mentioned a second ago something that you just said again, which was the, the setting up the documentation that you need that tracks everything and this is where if you haven't done a device before or haven't started a drug discovery process before talking to another founder who's done it makes a big difference because laying out all that documentation of even your design of your experiment and what you're doing if you start that right at the beginning versus having to backtrack you're generally better off is what i've heard and been told again not not, not my core expertise but that's something yeah, I meant that to reiterate. It helps with that de-risking. Jennifer, on that yeah. note, um, yeah, just go ahead. Excuse me, Nicole. No, I was just going to reiterate. Um, Jennifer had made that point early on as well. Yeah, networking with uh, with peers who have kind of uh, gone through the process in a a similar technology area um, that's invaluable. And that, that leads into a question we have from, from one of our participants on what is your advice for how to vet FDA consultants versus FDA counsel? And this is specific to medical device category. So Jennifer, I'm not sure if this falls into, into your expertise. Is that? I can't answer that question with that specificity. Okay. All right. I can tell you good people who I talk to who know these things better than I do. I talked to a person named Devin Campbell okay. on the um, FDA device side the device and clinical trial side. He's done some biologics, I think also. And then uh, Retsina Meyer, who's uh, built a pharma company and then sold it early on is another. And Tim, you might have some insight into this. Are you, are you, I mean, throughout your processes, at what stage did you feel comfortable enough to be able to navigate these things on your own? And, and at what stages, if, it, if you were, you know, entering a new, new product, new, new, new line item, uh, however you phrase it in your world, how would you evaluate bringing someone on to help? Guide yeah, I, I'll be honest. I know that when, uh, on the, uh, on the attorney and IP side, I, uh, I, I literally called it an interview and, uh, Jennifer, I, um, I don't know if what you do too on the, on the legal side, but I, I said, this is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm building. Do you, does this make, does this sound interesting to you? Because I look at my attorneys, um, my wife's attorney, my brothers are attorneys. So we got a lot of attorneys so we can do all the attorney jokes we want, which is to say that I'm not looking for a mechanic. What I'm looking for is a business partner. And if you can, if you can sit down and say, "Look, at this is my vision. This is where I'm going," and you can get excitement from, like we use DLA Piper right now, and um, 
Andy Gilberts, the co-global lead for Life Sciences, when I first told him what we were doing two years ago, he said, I'm in. And so he's been in since the very beginning. And uh, he says, this is definitely where we, we should be going. So, um, and I interviewed five different law firms. And so it becomes, I was a consultant for 20 years with the NY and other companies. It really becomes, you know, it's a big company, but it's an individual relationship. And uh, so I say, know what you, where you want to go and find that person that you can, that believes in you and that you trust their expertise. Um, and I think that that's kind of how I approach it. Wonderful. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I'm going to, go back into the questions and, and double check if there's anything fresh here, but I wanted to give you all the opportunity to really just, just kind of close out with, you know, again, your, your overall perspective on kind of some, some thoughts that can really help uh, kind of the general um, field. I know that we've touched on uh, device versus, versus kind of the, the, the farm industry. Um, and Nicole, I'll, I'll start with you and, and really just what is your kind of best piece for people to take away from this uh, when, when going into kind of the next stages of their, of their business and their startup? Yeah, sure. I think we've heard a lot of um, interesting considerations and, you know, taking kind of that step back and higher level view, um, kind of taking a time up front to understand how these different um, pieces fit together and to put together the right advisory team so that, you know, you're getting um, that expertise and, and guidance um, so that you know, you're kind of alone navigating all of this. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, moving pieces, a lot of, um, a lot of things to, to get right, um, especially if, um, you know, trying to bring a product to market and, and secure, secure funding, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, IP is definitely an important piece of it. Um, it fits into the, the regulatory scheme in terms of um, you know all the, the data and disclosure requirements are um, are very important. Um, you know, you're not only talking about the U.S. but also trying to navigate this process internationally as well, which is you know, we look like on the FDA here. But a lot of our clients are are looking at us. Uh, you know, CD marketing in, in Europe, uh, et cetera, which is a whole other um, ball game. But um, um, yeah, just kind of, I think the more you can kind of keep your advisory team uh, current and, and have check-ins so that they feel sort of on board with, with what's going on. Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know until, you know, someone, someone mentions uh, an angle or, um, or, or an idea. So Right. Um, I think we're at our best as you know, outside counsel in any capacity, whether it be regulatory or IP, if, if we have a good sense for what's going on with the business and um, partnerships and different, um, different things going on. Um, and then, then people can advise you accordingly. Um, you know, one thing that, came, that also comes to mind is um, there's a whole area of IP law where if the regulatory process holds up your go-to-market timeline, there's provisions um, to get an extension of patent term um, you know, in the event that you have a patent allowed, but you, you can't market the product yet because you haven't yet gotten um, um, FDA approval. So there's, there's lots of things, the nuances that um, yeah, it's just good to put together your, um, your team of advisors. Right. I'll jump in if I think of anything. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just going to leave everybody with a, a thought that, you know, when we, whether it's biotech or whether it's device, think about, think about three to five years down the road or even sooner as we again move toward a value-based pricing model for healthcare, that you're going to want to build in some way of proving the efficacy of the particular uh, solution that you're building, whether that's a device or whether that's a uh, biotech. Um, and there's just some such cool uh, technology that's coming out that's going to allow us to hook into these future state devices. And with post-COVID-19, more and more care and more chronic care, more, more acute care is going to be delivered in the home 
and delivered in the community than in the hospital because there's a lot of uh, concerns about going to hospitals. Hospital revenue is reduced by four, declined by 40% in a lot of places, even though it's, inclined, it's increasing now. The reality is, is that this is like a, uh, it's kind of like getting a, getting a shock treatment with the COVID-19 stuff where care is going to be, we probably jumped ahead 10 years in terms of moving toward telehealth, virtual care, IOT, and self-managed care in the community. So just think ahead a little bit about how it's going to work and how you're going to get paid. That's my two cents. Nice. Jennifer? Sure. I think, um, I guess my last words of advice are to really think about um, your business, not just as the device and the path you have to walk for approval, but also really about what's the end game. You know, what market do you serve? Who are the patients? How are you going to get paid and how do you facilitate that? I think um, we're in a much better place now than we were 10 years ago, especially around digital health and use of digital health when we didn't even have codes for people to bill. And we now have some of that. Right? We watched a lot of things kind of pilot till the cows came home and then never actually get paid because that efficacy or the value to the payer wasn't strong enough. So as you walk this other pathway, that's the pathway for regulatory, just like Tim said, you really also have to walk the pathway for uh, the value and to whom.